Uh, Clara Sousa Silva is a molecular astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Clara spends most of her time studying molecules that life can produce so that one day she can detect an alien biosphere. Her favorite molecular biosignature is phosphine, a terrifying gas associated with mostly unpleasant life. Please welcome Clara Sousa Silva. Hi there. Um, yes, I am Clara and, uh, oh, I can see everything. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, what I do is exactly as it was described. I try to understand how to detect life beyond Earth. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how we're getting that done. Now, we know it's possible to look for life beyond Earth because we have been telling the galaxy that we have life on Earth for a long, long time. We, oops, sorry, without even meaning to, humans have been sending out radio signals for over a hundred years and audiovisual signals since our first strong TV broadcast in the late 1920s. So we know if there are any intelligent species out there in the galaxy, some would, intentionally or otherwise, be sending out signals like these, radio. And all we have to do is wait for their message, listen in. But so far, we've heard absolutely nothing, just silence. And the silence would be very disappointing for someone like me, whose entire career is focused on finding life. But there's one important point to make here, and that is that in our planet, there have been billions of species, but only one of them has been sending out radio signals into space, and only extremely recently. But Earth itself has been teeming with life for billions of years. And although, of course, I would love to find some advanced, benevolent alien civilization, I would happily settle for finding alien zebras or alien forests, alien algae. So how can we detect life on a planet when it's not actually broadcasting its presence through radio or TV? Well, to illustrate that, let's reverse the problem. Imagine an alien astronomer was on the other side of the galaxy looking for a habitable planet in her night sky about 200 years ago before humans started fidgeting with radio. If this alien astronomer pointed their powerful spectroscope, their telescopes or our sun, they would be able to split our sun's light into its spectrum. And this is exactly what they would see. They would see that our sun's light has been broken up into a, a rainbow, a spectrum, but they would also see that some of this light would have been absorbed by atoms and molecules in the sun and leave behind these tiny shadows that we call absorption lines. And that's because molecules behave in a really unique way. Molecules have to follow the laws of physics, but they're so small that they have to follow the rules of the quantum world. And one of those very strict rules is that they have to absorb quantized amounts of energy, and these correspond to specific wavelengths of light, and consequently, unique absorption lines on a spectrum. Different stars have different compositions, and consequently, a different spectrum, and this is our suns. So that an alien astronomer, would look at this spectrum and using their universal knowledge of how atoms and molecules behave, know exactly what the composition of the sun was. But if they were patient and fortuitously aligned, they would notice that every year, a few additional absorption lines would appear and then disappear, and then a year later appear again. And these new lines would be due to the molecules in the atmosphere of the earth as it passes in front of the sun. And an alien civilization with only slightly better technology than we have now would be able to study these absorption lines and learn that we are a thriving, complex, living planet. You can think of our atmosphere and its subsequent spectrum as a planet-sized message communicating to the galaxy that we have oceans and forests and rich life cycles. And we can do the same to them. Look for the signs that alien life didn't mean to make all the molecules that life can produce and release into an atmosphere and form a biosphere that we can decipher. Molecules, for example, like these, which life that is familiar to us produces and often in large quantities. The problem is none of these molecules would on their own necessarily indicate life as they all have false positives, by which I mean non-biological sources that can also emit these molecules into an atmosphere, things like volcanism and photochemistry. These molecules are wonderful, but thermodynamically speaking, they're easy to make. And so detection of any of these molecules on their own 
in an atmosphere wouldn't necessarily indicate life. Now, there are two solutions to this false positive problem. The first is to think of context. For example, oxygen on its own is not a particularly good biosignature, but in the context of our planet, our sun, and the other components of our atmosphere, oxygen is a wonderful biosignature. Sadly, context is not always easy to determine, mainly because atmospheres could be made up of a lot of molecules, and so this context is very complex. My old group at MIT tried to come up with a, a list of all the possible atmospheric gases that could form the context of a biosphere, and they found that that list contained 16,367 molecules. So you can imagine quite how hard it would be to establish atm atmospheric context, which in turn makes it extremely difficult to resolve the false positive scenarios for those popular biosignatures. Which brings me to the second solution to this false positive problem, and that is look for molecules that although maybe less popular, are biosignatures with very low false positives, and so need less context to signify life. And my favorite example of these molecules is phosphine. Now, when I first met phosphine, it was very much considered a bad biosignature. In fact, phosphine was only known for two things. One, as a marker for violent storms on Jupiter and Saturn. Phosphine is detected in the upper layers of these planets, but it's a little surprising because phosphine is not supposed to be able to be formed there. Phosphine needs much higher temperatures and much higher hydrogen pressures than we find in the observable layers of these planets. What happens is phosphine, after being happily formed in the hellish depths of these planets, is aggressively dragged up by strong currents, surviving to the top with very large concentrations before ultimately being destroyed by the sun and other radicals in the atmosphere. But rocky planets like the Earth don't have those extreme environments like you find in the depths of Jupiter. So phosphine is never made spontaneously. Which brings me to the second thing phosphine is known for. On Earth, phosphine is notorious for being a lethal and foul-smelling molecule. Phosphine interacts fatally with oxygen metabolism, so it's a very effective killer. For this reason, we often use phosphine as pesticides. And sadly, for also for this reason, humans have used it as a chemical warfare agent in the First World War and most recently by ISIS. So phosphine is deadly, but it is only deadly because of its interaction with oxygen metabolism. And so it's deadly with a very important exception. That is, life that doesn't rely on oxygen can happily produce phosphine. And on Earth, we have such life forms in places such as sewage, marshlands, rice fields, lake sediments, the intestinal tract of fish, the intestinal tract of babies, the feces of penguins, the farts of badgers, and actually the intestines and excrements of most animals. And what all of these ecosystems have in common is that they host anoxic life that produces phosphine quite happily since phosphine is not toxic to them. And for the majority of time that life existed on Earth a long time ago, it also didn't rely on oxygen. So other planets with life less oxygen loving than that on modern Earth could also produce phosphine as a good, robust biosignature. With that in mind, my team and I simulated loads of hypothetical planetary systems with phosphine-producing biospheres, and we found that with near-future telescopes, we could find it reasonably easy to detect these phosphine-producing biospheres on hydrogen-rich and CO2-rich planets orbiting sun-like stars and also smaller stars like brown dwarfs. And this made phosphine a really promising biosignature. What makes phosphine a really good biosignature is that it seems to have no significant false positives as long as it's found on rocky planets. So definitely not a sign of life on Jupiter. We came to this conclusion by considering every false positive scenario we could conceive of. We looked at standard chemical processes and we found that in all cases, the formation of phosphine on rocky planets is highly thermodynamically disfavored. So then we looked at more intense systems like lightning or volcanism and meteors, and we found that even in the most favorable scenarios, phosphine could only be produced in teeny tiny quantities and always many orders of magnitude below anything we could detect. So at that point, we looked into increasingly more implausible formation mechanisms and found that none could produce any phosphine that we could ever detect. So with this finding in mind, 
I published an article in January this year with this tweetable conclusion saying any detectable amounts of phosphine found on a rocky planet cannot be explained without life. But this manuscript spent about a year and a half in revision. And when I submitted this paper in 2018, it was a cool conclusion, but it wasn't a controversial conclusion because it was just me describing a completely theoretical, hypothetical situation no one was concerned about. For years, I told many board audiences about phosphine and how great a biosignature it was. I asked them to imagine these kind of distant planets, a wet, anoxic tropical paradise with a rich anaerobic biosphere producing tremendous amounts of phosphine, signaling life unambiguously. And some of you might now know that this was a very naive attitude, because a few months later, I got a weird email from Jane Greaves, an astronomer at Cardiff, saying, I think I found phosphine on Venus. Is that weird? I think it's weird. I'm paraphrasing here, Jane is very professional, but Jane was telling me that her and her colleagues had a tentative detection of phosphine in the clouds of Venus, which is the only potentially habitable location on that planet. Jane knew that might be a big deal, but she didn't know anyone who knew about phosphine in an astrobiological context. Fortunately, Paul Rimmer, a mutual colleague, had been a member of one of those board audiences where I told everyone how amazing phosphine was as a biosignature. So Jane got in touch to ask, how good a biosignature is it? And I told Jane what I'm telling you right now, which is, it's a wonderful biosignature. And are you sure you found phosphine? Because that's insane. And that was the beginning of our collaboration. We uh, got extra observation time with ALMA, a powerful telescope that uh, seemed to confirm the signal detected with a weaker telescope, JCMT. And we worked really hard to figure out a, is it really phosphine? And B, if it is, is there really no way of making it without life? We considered every possible molecule and we found that phosphine was indeed the best candidate for the signal. And we found that the signal corresponded to very high concentrations of phosphine. And so at that point, led by William Baines, we expanded my analysis of phosphine on hypothetical exoplanets to apply to the very concrete example of Venus. And we couldn't no matter how hard we try, explain the presence of phosphine in the quantities we found it without life uh, intervening. So at that point, being faced with the exhaustion of all abiotic means of production, we seize on the possibility that this phosphine might just be produced by life. Now, there's still much we don't understand about Venus, so all we really know is that something strange is happening on Venus, some exotic, unknown chemistry. Now, whether that's exotic, unknown biochemistry, that's uh, something for us to figure out with the rest of the scientific community. And there are many next steps to understanding phosphine on Venus, starting with addressing these primary uncertainties of the discovery. And we will need many more observations, more models and more work to understand this. But what I want to highlight this right now is how a virtually unknown and really quite revolting molecule became such an important piece in the puzzle for figuring out life beyond Earth. And we can now look for phosphine on planets all over the galaxy, but the lesson here is not that we should look for phosphine, but we shouldn't ignore molecules just because they're not abundantly produced by life that is familiar to us. Phosphine is just one of those thousands of molecules that could form a biosphere, and we are currently not able to detect the majority of them. In fact, we can only detect about 4% of them. For the majority of biosignatures, we are not prepared to detect them. And I'm currently working to solve this problem with many students from high school to PhD level. But right now, we are not prepared to both detect and understand the presence of a biosphere on an alien planet. So my biggest professional concern is not that we will fail to point our telescopes at an inhabited planet in our lifetime. My biggest professional concern is that we'll point our telescopes directly at an inhabited planet, but not have the tools to know it. Together with a large group of students, my goal is to provide the tools to understand alien biospheres so that one day we will know life when we see it. Thank you.